That's awesome. <laughs> All right. It says creating a live broadcast. I think we, I think, are we live? What does it say over there? Does it, we're live. I think we're live. This is live. I think Let's we're live. Go. Is this live? Live? Yep. It's okay. Live. It says live. It says live. So we, is this real? Is this really happening right now? You and it me? Is, man. This is live. This is real, right? <laughs> We're doing this? We're doing this. Sunday You're Night on. Live. Sunday, You're on. Sunday Night Live. Steve Green, my friend Steve Green. Can I tell you something, man? Yes, my brother. I got to tell you, getting to know you has been a lot of fun. Has been a lot of fun. It's been eye-opening, and it has, it has moved me in lots of ways. As I've gotten to know myself better, as I've gotten to know you better, as we've kind of been hanging out together. And Thank you. I got to tell you, I got a story about Steve Green I want to open with so people get to know who this guy is that I'm talking to on Facebook Live. And I got to know you a little bit a couple of years ago here and there through different people. But the, the memory that I have most of you was on an airplane. An it was airplane. on an airplane. And you, you might not remember, but you and I were on an airplane together. We were? We were. There were a lot of other clergy on this flight. It was from Toronto to Winnipeg. And you came on the flight, you looked over, you saw me sitting there, and you said, Giffen's here? Oh, this just got real. <laughs> I said that? You did. And we were on our way to go and see the ordination of our friend and mentor, Bill Cliff. Do you know it's five years tomorrow? It is. It is five, five years, years tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was, said that? Really? You did. You did. And I remember thinking <laughs> to myself, Steve Green knows who I am. Steve Green knows who I am. Oh, I love that. Vice versa. <laughs> vice versa, man. Vice versa. Vice versa. 100%. You know, let me tell you something. Bill Cliff, a lot of people might not realize this, but Bill Cliff spent about a decade and a half as the chaplain at Huron College. Um, and I was at the very beginning of his time back in like 2002, 2003, 2004, and you were at the very end of his time. I was. And That's amazing. It is. Are you serious? I, it is. Yeah. Nice. And, there's a, and there's a bunch of us in between, but I've always thought that a, there's this bond between those who sat in the chaplain's office at Huron College in Bill Cliff's office. You know what I mean? He's a, he's a beautiful man. He's a beautiful man. Without him? I can honestly say, without him, I would not be an Anglican priest. 100%. Well, let me talk 100%. about that for a sec. So, Steve Green, Anglican priest, pastor, Cambridge, St. Thomas's, St. Luke's, BIPOC advocate, Diocese of Huron. What am I missing? What am I, what am I missing there in that, that introduction to Steve Green? Uh -huh. A husband and a father. Isn't that the important stuff? Yeah, man. A husband and a father. I want to know Christ you follower, Christ follower is number one, husband is two, father is three. Everything else, oh, those, great, those top three in that order That's too. Great. In that order as well. Yeah. In that order. So, I, but yeah, you think, think of them all as vocations. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You're a dad. You know that man. It's all oh, do, man. <laughs> don't I? Don't I, man? Woo! I believe I, no, I, I, I wrote in my book. I said, I said, I am, I believe I am God ordained to protect my son. Amen. That's a vocation, right? Like, amen. Yeah. Amen. So amen. we're getting together amen. tonight to talk a little bit about some different topics. Um, I did have a couple of fr friends and, and, and people say to me, you guys are getting together to talk about what? You're going you're gonna to talk <laughs> about what? You're going to talk about a church season. You're going to talk about black history, and you're gonna talk about one of the most controversial topics on the news today. And I said, do I said it. you're done right, that's what we're gonna talk about. That is what we're gonna talk about. Let's do this. Let's First dance. Step in a second. I, I served as a priest for a whole decade. Um, I was at your cathedral at one point in, uh, in Huron. Um, I, uh, I loved Lent. Oh man, did I love Lent. And most people have no idea what I'm talking about. They know Easter, they know Christmas, they know like they know if they know about Lent, they know they're supposed to give something up, maybe chocolate or something. Good. That's kind of the that's what I hear about it at least on uh, in the on the the outer walls of church land. 
So you tell me, Pastor Steve Green, what's this Lent thing <laughs> doing right now? First and foremost, I want to thank you tremendously for giving me this opportunity to come into your show and to speak and to talk and to converse. So, and many blessings to you, man. You're a beautiful man. And I love your leadership, your great work that you're doing. So I tremendously thank you. Tremendously for the opportunity. Lent, yeah, man. Um, the 40 days of walking in the wilderness as Elijah did, Moses did with Yahweh in the mountain. Jesus did when he was tempted by Satan. 40 days on understanding our relationship with Jesus. Uh, not trying to abuse God or misuse God or try to have a self-righteousness of God or try to control, manipulate the situation with the Holy God. It's our walk towards the cross. So it's self-sacrifice. It's a self-denial. It's you can only have Easter if you've gone through Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. You, you can sound only like have a really, you sound like a really popular guy with all that fun stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can only have resurrection, man, if you're dead. You can. That's it. You can only you can only have resurrection going through death. And Jesus Christ has taught us that. Um, not only on the physical, moving to the spiritual, the eternal life, going from the temporal now into the eternal life, but also in our circumstances. Things die. If we trust it in God, there's a resurrection. There. There's a new life, a new bringing. And so Lent does that. It changes us. It transforms us. It prunes us. It says in John 15, those things that are not bearing good fruit, that are not showing and illustrating the world of Christ's light and love, yeah. gets cut off. And so Lent is that moment, that time of 40 days on, yeah, there's a fasting, cool, but more so, I think more so it's the discipleship, okay. deepening our faith. Okay. Um, that's critically important, especially now when people are walking in loneliness yeah, and abject fear. So much isolation um, right now, isn't there? Like every Isolation. Everywhere. People are struggling with mental <laughs> health yeah. and people are crying out saying, man, where, where's this God of yours? Where's this God of yours? <laughs> And we can say he's he's still there. At times I've walked yeah. away and I'm like, where's this God? Yeah. But God's like, nah, man, I got you. I love you. I've redeemed you. Mm -hmm. I've saved you. I'm yeah. walking with you. Now yield to me. Listen to me and get in relationship with me. Instead of trying to use me for a, like a Santa Claus or a vending machine, I don't play I that you. kind of game. And as we always say, I play, I play for keeps. God plays for keeps. God plays for keeps. <laughs> God plays for keeps, man. Straight up. He's like, I, I died for you. So it's all, I'm risking everything. I'm risking everything to have my relationship with you. So Lent is that, man. It's all well, that. That's, well, it's a thing I've come to respect about you so much in the, in the time we've gotten to know each other is, is you leave it all out on the field, right? Like you're, uh, right, like you got this life, right? You got this life to do what you're going to do with it. And you put it all out on the field and you make no apologies for it. I will not. I learned from, uh, from great men, i.e. you, Bill Cliff, some powerful women in my life, my mom being one, my grandmother, my mom's mom on saying, God built you for a reason. He made you for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically you're either with him or you're against him. Yeah. And it comes to self-denial, mm -hmm. hence in Lent. Um, so I was, I was built that way just to say, God, and I trust me, I've, I've done some stupid crap. Like I've done some dumb, dumb crap, but once again, God's I'm with you. So yeah, leave it up as you got a Kaepernick on the background. You got do, in the background, two players who, who especially I'm Jordan, especially Jordan. I will, I will get sick. I will have a fever and I'm going to still, <laughs> I'm going to go, I'll, I'll, I'm going to go to Gates, Charles Barkley oh, in Phoenix. I'm going to whoop yeah, you. Those are fight I'm going to go against Clyde yeah. Trexler oh, from oh. Portland. I'm going to whoop you. Okay. I'm going to go against Magic Johnson. Right. No, I'm no, going to whoop you. You just call me out. You just call me out. You just call no, me no, out. So, oh, it's going to happen. Two my players, man. Especially Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Man, These I love players, that boy. Man. These are incredible, incredible men. Incredible men. Amen. Yep. Michael Jordan, who got cut from his high school high school basketball team, right? Who was counted out, who was told no deal, no deal. Yeah, man. Six yeah, man. championships. Yeah, man. Six championships. Colin Kaepernick, who you and I, we we, we were talking about the other day because I sent you a photo from, from yeah, way back, the way back playback where I'm a Niners fan. So Kaepernick was rookie, led us to, almost led us to a Super Bowl championship. Um, yeah. And I remember as well as anyone, as well as anyone, when he started sitting for the anthem and then taking the knee. Yeah. Um, 
And I remember watching it all. And as I watched this, this little boy of mine grow, who you've met, Rory Seven, um, you know, I want him to know, um, I want him to know heroes that don't just look like us. You know what I mean? Amen. Um, yeah, man. So we can, around this house, we keep up Jordan, we keep up Kaepernick. Um, oh, we have Desmond Tutu's African prayer book. As Ooh. It's good stuff. And Ooh. it is good stuff. Yeah, man. And I heard you say, I think it was you, the other day talking about the convergence between Lent and Black History Month. Because yeah. they intersect this year, and you've been doing a whole bunch of things with Black History Month for the Diocese of Huron. And it's getting a bunch of attention. And I want to ask you a few questions about that. But sure, man. can you start just telling me what, what, what started in February for Huron and you, and, and what have you been doing? Great question. So yeah. as you know, I'm a father. Uh, and I have children of different ethnicities. And so by the grace and the mercy, and the beauty of my wife, Tracy, we do a lot of fostering and we're being blessed and also to adopt. So on a side note, today is our, our gotcha day with Caleb. I mean, so one gotcha year ago, day literally day today, I know what it is, but you got to tell everyone what the gotcha day is. One, gotcha. Literally, one, one year ago today, thanks to, as well, the Master Giuseppe family. So Carlo and his beautiful wife, Michelle, beautiful people. They're beautiful inside and out. Um, went to court in Kitchener and we're able to adopt Caleb. Um, and so what literally one year ago today, we're able to say it's now Caleb Green. Um, so I feel bad for the boy, I'm his dad. Aye. God is good, God is good. So, but yes. Can I and so in, in this, in this I... month of Lent and also black history um, and because of Todd and his charge, we have to have a new church, a just church, a learning church and diverse church uh, that was an opportunity not just to have those simple posts of critical black yeah. people, um, but critical black Christian voices. So, and there's a slew of them. Like there's obviously Dr. King and Mahalia Jackson. You got Manchin Massimola. You got you got beasts from like as one of your boys, Moses the Black. Moses the Black. Moses the Black was a bad, <laughs> bad man. Hey, bad tell me, brother. Tell me a little bit about Moses the Black. I want to hear a little bit about oh, Moses. Oh man, he's. So he's a desert father, yeah. also known as Abba. And there's also some, some beasts of women who are like Ama, Ama Theodora, so also desert mothers. So Moses the Black, he's been known as Moses yes. the Robber. Literally a beautiful conversion story, a guy who would rob and do a whole bunch of nonsense, but then because of the grace of God, he became Moses the Black, a prominent ascetic who would move himself into the wilderness and have this beautiful community by which people would come to him. And one day, because this dude was strong and big and he was just a, he was a bad mofo. Four guys are trying to rob the dude. I know. And he took them all out. I know. And not only took them all out, he brings them into the community and says, you're going to believe in Jesus. And they're like, yes, sir. <laughs> Done. Now, so fourth, people like that. Fourth, like, fourth century, right? 1600 fourth. years ago? Oh, jeez. Yeah. Dude's a beast. So men and women like that. So you got Mihaly Jackson, Fannie Lou Hammer. The names go on and on and on. So I was only... It's 28 days. And so I not only want to select men and women of the past, hence black history, but critically to me was to also represent and present voices of today yeah. for the future. So black futures month. So we had a uh, Reverend uh, yes. Musa Daba. We had a uh, Reverend Marita Williams. We've had a Tiana Goka. And so men and women who are making an impact today, uh, Pastor Sandy Thomas, who are moving us forward and saying, I will stand on the shoulders of, um, I don't know, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, um, Howard Thurman. I will stand on their shoulders and I'll move us forward in the name of Jesus. So yeah, you got James Cone, like, the list goes on. It's, it's some beasts, beasts of the faith. And so hence presenting these names um, on a daily basis, some, some bio on them, um, little clips on what I think about these, these great men and women um, to study about them. Um, yes. Tertullian, for example, who presented um, the Trinity, the name, tr the title Trinity. Um, so also understanding that the Christian faith, because I've heard many times, it's a white man's religion. Oh. But if you go back in time, man. it can't be a white man's religion. The Church of Ethiopia? A, it goes yeah. against the Bible. Say, sorry? The Church of, in Ethiopia in the early centuries of the, ch of the church is a central church in, the, in church history. Um, oh, when I went to Jerusalem, I was amazed 
at the stewardship of of the very the central church of the resurrection in in jerusalem mm. is supported by a group of different churches majority african churches yeah it's incredible it's a, like it and we lost that in the west we've entirely forgotten the african church in the west and it's where the majority of the church is in the world it is and they're critical voices in ethiopia in libya i mean the the, the countries go morocco like the, the names go on and on and on um, and so I, I was blessed and thanks to Bishop Todd and to Davor and to, and to Marty Levesque on saying, here, here's some names. And they're like, give it, pulse them up and we'll spread them. And so people from Chilliwack, BC to Halifax were like, hey, amen, thank you for this. Um, churches in Toronto, ch and I, was, I was blessed. I was blessed. So this is just, just the beginning because we have to learn. Um, and not only the BIPOC, so it's Black History Month. And so for March, starting tomorrow, Thanks to uh, Pastor Roberto Asensio, who is a pastor at Emmanuel Church in Cambridge, yeah. bringing up the names of Latino Latinas. Oh, and then the goal is to go to Asian theologians. And then the goal is to go to First Nation theologians. So we, we got to know these voices. We got to know these voices and the mm -hmm. impact they've made. Um, because of, unfortunately, because of history, we're like, hey, Black history started at slavery. No. Or the Christian church started back at, no. Here's a, here's a fun fact for you. <laughs> Eight to 20% of the people who came across from the Atlantic transatlantic slave trade were Muslim. 23 to 25% who came across the transatlantic slave trade were Congolese Catholic. So we're always told they didn't have a faith. They didn't have a faith, they didn't have a religion. Right there is a 31, minimum of 31% who had a faith, be it Muslim or Congolese Catholic who came across and we're not and we're not told this yeah we're not we're not told this yeah. so hence being a learning church and saying okay there's more there's more rich history here that we have to you know from black from brown from asian from latino from latinas from first nation we got to hear these voices and their stories um and i love story and i love stories i love hearing about stories i know you're fan, you're a fantastic storyteller yeah. fantastic Thank storyteller Thank and so to hear these stories and go yeah man so two critical things just to jump on this one, that came across, there's multiple things, but two critical things that came across in the slave trade for the black people. One was rhythm. Okay. So having that beat of rhythm, of understanding the rhythm. So you're, you're, just, you're as a sardine in, a, in the belly of a boat and you have rhythm in your mind, you have a beat and you're singing to God's glory in the boat and you know you may not make it. And 15%, 15% died. So you got that rhythm. Another mm. critical part was call and response dialogue so if you hear if you know of the old testament all the oral tradition i'm going to tell my story to my children my children will tell me to my grandchildren and hence the richness of the african tradition and also preaching was i'm going to tell my story i'm going to tell my story hence of lent i was walking in the wilderness of pain and suffering and strife and struggle but god came and delivered me i will walk in with god's glory to therefore move into a space into a place of prominence and provision and protection by god this is what was told us brought across into the new world and we still had the song. So if you're getting beaten and bruised by society today, God still got your back because you're still delivered in God. And the black people, remember, yes. you're shackled, man, and you're still gonna talk about hope. You're gonna get whipped, you got, you're gonna get raped, your children get sold, and you're still talking about hope? Yo, man, this God don't play, he played for keeps. Straight up, he will not back down. So I don't care who you are, BIPOC, white you have mental health issues god is still there and god is still there. i know it i know it you know one of the ways i know it is spending time with you man that's how that's one of the ways that, oh, that i know it i got tell you brother i'll tell you let me tell you something. i gotta tell people something and I, I, I haven't asked permission but i'm gonna tell anyway so okay. <laughs> i don't know this, this morning is uh is sunday and people can't i'm living uh downtown toronto so we're locked down we're not going to church around here right like that's that doesn't happen and to be honest with you i haven't gone to, to church a lot the last couple of years that's uh, you know that that's a bit of the truth working out working that out trying to trying to figure out where where my place is and all of that but i'm still raising a seven-year-old boy right who who right. has a a deep faith that began in his baptism at six months old. So um, yes. I'm not, you know, I, uh, I'm not taking that away from him and I'm going to work to nurture it. And one of the ways I do lately is uh, we, we, we turn, we tune in at nine o'clock uh, to St. Tom's church in Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
And we, I'm humbled. Thank you. We Thank enjoy you. listening to Pastor Green, but this morning Rory's not with me this weekend. And uh, some, 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 you know, and some folks in my network know my grandfather passed away this weekend. Mm. And so I was on the phone with my mom just before nine this morning, and uh, my mom and I sat on the phone uh, the day after my grandfather died, and I held the phone up to the screen so the two of us. Uh, uh, on, two, on two different continents uh, with you in a different city from the both of us um, as we listen to incredibly liberating and holy words and, uh, and, and grieved my grandfather. Um, and uh, tell you, man, you, a little bit of church for you went all the way across the Atlantic this week. It made a big difference. Thank you. So, uh, you're doing some amazing things. I got to tell you that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm humbled. I'm humbled, man. Tremendously by your words. Let me Thank ask you. Thank you. You. Okay. Black Lives Matter. Okay, here's the thing. I'm a big black, you know, I remember 2016. Uh, it was a, I remember it was a hot summer, man. It was a hot summer as we went to that November election where Trump was going to get elected. And, uh, yeah. A lot of stuff going on. I remember I made a Black Lives Matter post and I have never um, seen my friend list drop in number as fast as I did um, that day in 2016. Um, mm. Um, it was as though I had posted a whole bunch of swear words and um, I was surprised, genuinely surprised because you think, you think you have an idea of what your network looks like and then you realize that it doesn't look like what you thought it looked like and then you have to examine yourself a little bit and you have to ask about your own racist tendencies and your own privileged past and your own... And then you have a really long, hard look and a really hard conversation with people who don't look like you. And maybe it's time to, to start thinking about whether or not Black Lives Matter has something to say. Um, and I'm hearing more and more white people saying that. More and more people of privilege saying that. I think this last year moved a lot of people. I think January 6th shocked people in ways that they, uh, they didn't expect. Maybe they should have been prepared for it. But they, they were shocked in ways they didn't, they, they didn't expect. True. I want to ask you, yeah. you man, um, because I know you really well now in the last couple of months. I, uh, uh, I've come to respect you deeply, uh, both as a colleague and as a man and as a black Thank man. You. Thank you. Um, but I want to know. I want to know why. Why do black lives matter? Amen. Yeah, so to quote, uh, is it Nanny Burroughs? Nanny Helen Burroughs. I think it's Nanny Helen Burroughs who said, there's a righteous discontent. Mm -hmm. So back in the time when she was speaking about that, black women, um, they were obviously pushed to the side, still is today, unfortunately, pushed to the side because the black men were now prominent, uh, powerful voices in the church. So obviously the black church was created and obviously men were saying, I want to keep hold onto this, I want my power. So then obviously you have the women saying, hey, man, we're doing a lot of work here. This is righteous discontent. This is not, this is not right. Mm -hmm. we, should, we should actually get some say and some acknowledgement and some recognition in what we're doing. So righteous discontent. So for Black Lives, it's a, it's a righteous discontent on our voices have been silenced for hundreds of years. Um, history in regards to the first resident coming over to the new land was a slave um, in regards to history of that. There's a righteous discontent in which the church has not stood beside those who have been marginalized and ostracized, by which Jesus says, I will stand beside those who are being persecuted. I will stand beside those who are being pushed down. I will lower the mountain and raise the valley. Yeah. So black lives do matter because of that. There's a righteous discontent. Um, a lot of systems in society are still haven't been changed. And let's be honest, the system was built in order to go against yes. BIPOC. So it's never, it's never been broken. So if anyone thinks it's been broken, you're playing yourself because John <laughs> A. McDonald literally created the system that will thwart the whole thing. I, and, and, he's, and you can look at his documents. He thinks of the First Nations people and a boop, think of a bad word. Thinks of the blacks, boop, and a bad word. Brown and a bad word. So our lives do matter because we're made in the image of God. And God loves diversity. God loves ethnicity. And it says in Revelation, every single nation will bow before him, but also profess he is king. And so 
if the first first university was in Timbuktu, yep. which is not a white school, let's no, be honest. That's no, not. <laughs> and, and the great theologians who came before Reinhold Niebuhr mm. and Diedrich Bonhoeffer, mm. and I love those guys, mm. black men and women and brown, we do matter. Our lives, by God's grace, have value. And we need to be heard of our stories and our struggle and to be taken mm. seriously, not just once a month, Mm -hmm. on for 28 days which i still find kind of odd we're giving the shortest month of the year oh, yeah. that's a different story yeah, it's funny <laughs> and not just to say and i know you don't do this but i find very interesting many i watch a lot of tv shows over and all that and they they'll get a black person on all right it's black history month yeah yeah just talk about michael jordan da, da, da. hits yeah. march the first yeah. yo where are black people gone I hear you. or brown people or asian people and so our lives are a great value in the eyes of God and should be in society. And so therefore the people, i.e. my brother, my brother in the yeah. to quote Dev, <laughs> to work together, yes, to leverage and say, I have to, I have to now lower my mountain to make sure it's, your valley gets raised. We true. have to be in the same ground because we can't as Christians, especially as Christians to say, it's acceptable to have this division and therefore you're always being marginalized. It's under, it's yeah, against yeah. the Bible. And so our Black Lives Matter, to me personally as well as a father, is because I have children who are biracial, but also I have children who are of, of First Nations, and I have Caleb who is Asian. And so if I don't stand up for them in the name of Jesus and say, my children's lives matter, why? Because A, God says so, and B, because I'm their father, I'm not done my job as a man, nor as a father, nor as a husband, nor even as a Christian, I haven't done my job. So Black Lives Matter for all of those, we're not just because of theological, but political, social, economical, raising these people up, hearing intentionally, overtly listening to the horrors, listening to the um, ostracization, listening to the marginalization, listening to the pain, like honestly listening to say, okay, I can't understand that, but I'm gonna still walk with you. I can't understand about being called the N-word, but I'm gonna still walk with you. I mean, I understand about you being slighted at a job because you're black. I'm going to still listen to you and walk with you. Not just say, I'm going to pat you in the back and say, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's garbage. Don't be doing that crap now in 2021. That does not work. Yeah. You can pull that crap off in 1950 and it's still unacceptable. Yeah. But to stand with yeah. us and say, this is not right. And we're not going to fight the same system that created this inequalities and inequities. So therefore, all of us, all of God's children move forward. So Dr. King wanted that. I see the mountaintop. So it's either you're with us at the mountaintop or you're going to well, get shut down. Because God, the truth about God the mountains says and the valleys, right? There's a, there's a hard truth about mountains and valleys. Is if scripture says that valleys are going to be raised and mountains are going to be leveled, then it's the mountains that are going to fill in the valleys. It's yep. not that the mountain's going away. It's that yep. it's going to integrate to level out the ground. Yes. Right? Amen. And so one end of valley people, i.e. the marginalized, the blacks, have always had hope. If you know the system is built against you and you still have hope, mm. you've got a deep faith. You've got a deep faith. But also then for those who are on the mountaintop, who are going to be made, made low, as you were saying before and beautifully said, here comes humility. Now you have to live in our shoes and understand the powerful stories that we have to tell on pain and suffering, on being slighted, or whatever it may be, on things that people think are jokes, are not jokes. No, they're not. And it's pain that we're trying to tell the people in song, in word, in plays, and saying, this ain't right, and this can't continue. And if you want to walk with us, get ready to get beaten too. And many people I know who will walk with us and take the beat. Well, but many will be like, yeah, I don't want, no, no. I don't want a persecution. I like my comfort zone, which comes back to Lent, self-denial. It's not about you. Look it's you. never about you. Look at Such you. a Christian, oh, you can never you. come to Look at everything. It's true. <laughs> come to baptism, you, you no longer exist. You've died to Christ. <laughs> so if your brother who's black or brown or Asian is in pain, you better suck it up, buttercup, because the pain's coming to you, and you better trust in Jesus. And if you don't, don't call yourself a Christian. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> God, it's don't so play, cool, man. man. He played for keeps. Steve, like, tell me none. something. Tell me something. Tell me. This. Yes, sir. Tell me this, okay? I got a rack. I, I got some rapid fire questions coming in a sec. Ooh. Okay, they're coming. Oh, <laughs> you talk about 
getting in the trenches. You talk about being a people of action, not just a people of word, not just a people yes, who confess with their lips, but people get their hands dirty. I know you. I hear you say you got it. I know you do. You got it. Okay. I've been talking to you for a little while. You've been telling me about some interesting ideas. And you've got an idea. We got this idea that's been playing in, in the fire. Oh. And I want to hear, I want to hear about it from you. I want to hear, I want to hear about what it is, what it looks like to really get our hands dirty in this. And it's an initiative called Focus. Can you tell me about Focus? Mm. Yes, sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Focus is an acronym. One of the acronyms is Fulfilling One's Commitment for Ultimate Success. So Fulfilling One's Commitment for Ultimate Success. Um, and success not only is like financial, which is one way, but more so as a Christian, it's up in faithful and fruitfulness. So you can think about the parable of the servant with five talents, and two talents, and one. The first two guys go out and they plant and they go. They go and get twice the amount. There's, there's a faithful, I trust, this man trusts me with his money. I'm going to go make yeah. him proud. So focus is an initiative by which is centered and focused towards the BIPOC community on how to raise them up. Um, so how to raise them up theologically, how to raise them up economically, how to raise them up socially, how to raise them up physically, how do we raise them up? So therefore that 15 year old kid who is struggling with his yeah. identity, be it a, he's a 15 year old Indian kid who may be transgender. If it's a 22 year old woman who's, who's just struggling to get ends meet and, who, and, and she is, I don't care, Asian. Okay. How do we step into that gap to say, we got you? Right. We got you with the resources. We got you with the people. We have got you with the space and the place that's safe for you to d to dominate. Focus is that we got to focus our mindset and our spirituality and our faith to make sure these people are no longer lagging behind. Which I believe Jesus does tremendously. He goes to Peter, James, and John says, "I'm bringing you along. I get this, Jesus." And you're like, "You guys don't get it at all." But <laughs> still drag you along to understand what I'm trying to do. Um, and so a critical part of focus to quote. Uh, Bishop Bill Cliff is, and it's hurt me tremendously because of my kids. And they're like, I don't want to go to church. It's boring. Like, come on, man. Like, I go to page 185, the BAS. I know the whole thing before it starts. Like, I'm bored. Like, give me something. Like, give me a DJ, oh. which I want. I'm not going to lie. But anyways, it's the church must be the mirror by which my kids can see yes. themselves. Period. That's Bishop Bill Clinton. I agree 100%. The mm. church must be the mirror by which my kids can see themselves. And so there's many churches out now who don't have many BIPOC communities. So sure. and that's geographically, that's fine. But once again, my kids, Trinity and Joshua and Caleb, must see other kids, who, other people who look like them to say, yes, the body of Christ is diverse. Yeah. and not just a whole bunch of white people. And in, leadership, see, yeah. and, and, and in leadership, we were, you know, we're talking about sport. Amen. We were talking about, we were talking about different parts of the economy. We we're talking about Fortune 500. Amen. Where are the BIPOC people? In leadership. Exactly. So how do we step into this new role of focus to say, how we raise them up, walk beside them. You have great leadership skills. You're a great man. You're a faithful man and also a humble man. So therefore you're able to help us move us into a space because you have certain skills and also you do have a certain platform by which I can't do. So therefore I can say, Dave, you can lead on this brother because I, I trust in your intelligence. I trust in your, your voice. I trust in your gifts. Lead. And there's certain times, okay, okay, Steve, you lead. Or, hey, Dev, you lead. Cool. It's tell me about work. Dev. So therefore tell, raising up. Tell, me, tell people about Dev. Who's our, who's our partner? Man. Dev? Yeah, Dev's a beast. Dev. Dev's a straight beast. So he's a brother um, by which he started Omni Media Communications like 14, yeah. 15 years old. And so he's been in the game for what, 20 some odd years? 20, how old is that? 36, 37? Like two, anyways, like 25, 26 years he's been in the game doing this, raising up literally up diversity and inclusivity and overt, not like some hidden backdoor nonsense. It's like, I'm going out to stick my neck out because these people, brown, black, Asian, so forth, must be heard. So he's been in this game of communications for a very long time. He's a critical piece, and he knows the game and landscape very well. And so he's a beautiful man as well. You're a beautiful man. And so how we work together, man, to get this job. So hence the people who are in BIPOC can move forward. Now, in saying that, we're not saying white folk no, don't no. need you. And we're not discrediting white no, people. No. no, no, not at all. Hey, hey, I'm Brothers the pastiest white guy there is around. Look at me, man. I, it doesn't get <laughs> pastier than me. Let's be honest. <laughs> Like, it's, it's all good. It's all, hey man, 
God loves diversity, man. The value mm -hmm. of white is how you leverage your position now. Because if you're still in that mindset of saying, we've done enough, and I've heard this, aren't the first people getting enough money? We've done enough for them and so forth. You've missed the point. And so, i.e. people who are white, you can still walk with us and we will walk with you. It's a partnership. It's a dialogue always led by God, always submitting to God. That's what it has to be that God has to lead and we follow and we are always attuned to his spirit because we know by human nature, if I lead, it's, it's going to get screwed up. Let's be honest. It's going to go left very, very fast because the ego and whatever. So we go and submit. I, okay, I need to help Dave. I've been there. Dave has helped me. <laughs> I, I, I need to help Dev. Dev helps me. How do we raise a oh, yeah. score? Who's an Asian woman? Who's a priest? How do we raise her? Mm. Up? How about, how about Ross? First, 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 first nations are deacon in the history of the diocese of Huron. Amazing. So thanks be to God for Todd for saying, I'm going to put you, I'm going to, I'm going to put That's you right. in this position of leadership. And also to Ross to say, I'm going to take this mantle and run with it. So, so therefore the next generation. So my daughter who's met Ross will say, wait, you look like me. All right. So you can lead in this church. You can serve in this church. All right. I'll run with you. Critical. So how do we help Ross now get to that next level to make sure that she's a dominant force for the kingdom of God? That's what we, and, and you said before, it's impact, impact for the kingdom. Every day. Man, I'm 45 years old, son. I don't have many years left. I got to make an impact for my kids and for the kingdom. And I can go, I'm done. I did my job. I'm done. Okay. That's what I care about. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You said something earlier um, about not just needing lip service. And I'll tell you, one of the, the great privileges of my life is, is getting to stand in the trenches with you. Um, like I, uh, I've, I've stood in some different trenches in my life. I really have. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, having a little call with my son and you the other day and us talking about scripture together um, and you telling my boy uh, mm. son, son of a single dad who's, who's, who's trying to do his best to be a good father you telling him that, that I was Jesus in your life recently um, yep I gotta tell you man um, yep. You, you, yep you believe in celebrating God in diversity because uh, I uh, <laughs> I'm living, I've lived a little while on the outside of the church. So um, thank you. Amen. If I could say two things, the critical two things here. Number thank one, you. you have a beautiful son. And that boy got game. Theologically? That's me. That boy, geez, come on. That boy, wow. He's anointed already. He's already anointed. And also of your guidance. And so I thank Todd tremendously oh, yeah. for joining us. Because you're able, and people don't know. So Dave is my coach. And so he's helping me to navigate. And let's be honest, I'm a black guy and a white man in a white church, a white man, a white woman's church. Let's be honest. Right now, predominantly it is white. So how do I navigate the waters and understanding the culture, but also to walk beside the people, as you would say, walk beside them, listening to their stories and also how to be one of them. And remember you saying that it's a critical part, but also a critical part for them to understand my walk. Exactly. So hence, it's a dialogue. Not just me submitting to them and saying, okay, you guys can step all over me. It's we have to learn each other's story, which is critical for us to move forward. We have to learn each other's pains, but also problems and victories so we can move forward. So what Dave has done tremendously is help me understand that. Where's my spot? What are my, what's my role and responsibilities as a black man? Who is a Christian? Who is an Anglican priest? creating borders and boundaries around that to walk faithfully in as being a father and as a husband, as an Anglican priest, but also to yield to the space I'm in. So there's certain good things for me to do um, that I'm able to speak in people's lives about strife and struggles as a black man, but also turning it around and say, okay, Mrs. McGillicuddy, you have problems of your own. I want to hear this. I want to preach about this because we need to know of your story. And so therefore there's always deliverance and victory in that. So what Dave has done tremendously is help me bounce ideas properly, how to also focus on critical things that need to be done now as an Anglican priest in 2021 and during COVID, but also to think future now. How do we get the next generation spiritually acute, spiritually aware, disciples? So not only for this generation today, and being faithful to the people who are going to the church today, but also, okay, there's a kid who's coming up who's 10 years old, who doesn't believe in God because he got abused. 
Okay. How do we now walk with him? Um, or the other kid, whatever it may be. So has you done a phenomenal, I'm very blessed. Honestly, I'm blessed by God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Todd Townsend. And, and thank you, Dave, Trim Dave Tremendously for walking with me to say, okay, you can't do that, Steve, because you may get fired. <laughs> or you, you can't do that because you may, you may get shot, son. Um, but to be honest and having humor, good times, but also being honest, just being straight up honest and me saying, yeah, you can do that, but be careful of these pitfalls or don't even touch that with a 10 foot pole right now because it's not, it's not going to work. Um, so yeah, man, I'm, I'm blessed. I'm blessed for you having been part of my life, man. Tremendous. Well, I'm not man. sure who's coaching who half the time. I'm not going to lie. I'm not sure who's coaching who half the time, but I got rapid oh, fire. So I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave your nice words as nice words. And I'm going to, I'm going to start okay. rapid fire at you. All right, here we go. Here we go. High church, low church. Tupac oh. or Big Biggie. Oh, damn, you did not. You did not bring that up. Damn. <sighs> Tupac. That's hard, man. Come on. It's like saying... I would, I would, I would, I would choose the same. I would choose the same. Oh, damn. Which one? Next Moses the Black or Moses the Egyptian? Oh, yeah. Moses the Black. Done. Done. Madonna of the 80s or Madonna of the first century? First century. Can't stand the Madonna of the 80s, man. That's pure. Nah, I ain't, I, I'll start cursing. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Greatest basketball player of all time. Of all. <sighs> Do it. We're going to start World War, we're start World War III right now. To me, to me, the guy in the back. Yeah. The guy in the back right there. Number two, There's three. No, two, three, man. No other answer. Two, there three. Is no other answer. But wait. Okay. But there's also Bill Russell. Remember Bill Russell this got 11 before, I, I am going to allow that. championships in 13 know, years, crazy. man. Right? Those statistics, they, I don't, I, those statistics are, he, that's, he, he's in the last two, he was a player coach. Tell me who Angela James is. Oh, you don't want to go there, do you? Do you I want do. to go here? I do. Okay. I do. I'm going to tell you, I looked her up this afternoon after you told me Angela James, and she shares a birthday with my little boy. Um, and she wears number eight, and I, um, I'm ordering a jersey because I want him wearing it, and I want to wear it. Angela one. James. Angela James. Okay. Got Angela James. So, yes. So before I start, Angela James was called by Bob Nicholson, who was the president of Hockey Canada, also CEO, I believe. He's high-ranking, yeah. well-recognized in Hockey Canada. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Said Angela James is the Wayne Gretzky of women's How hockey. How come I never That's heard of her? Oh, that's simple. So back in the 80s and 90s, she was a, like, literally Google her. Beast. Capital B E A S T, straight beast. Like she was dominating people. Like there's no like like Jordan to everyone else is just like, who wants to play in yeah. Let's go. I'm gonna destroy you before you even start. Yeah. She was doing that, racking up awards, racking up this uh, acclaims, and da 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 da. Um, one of two women who is part of the as a player. Um, right now I think it's three, but it's probably the first woman to be inducted as a female player in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Four or five women who've been inducted into the IIIHF uh, Federation. Beast, like acclamations and applause and all that good stuff, accomplishments galore. So it comes to 1998, I believe, late 90s, in which they're creating Team Canada going to Olympics, and she's off the list. So 1998, I believe she's in her mid 30s. I think she's 34 years old, and she's off the list, and she is dominant. Dominant. Like there's no denying her game. She's a black woman. Uh -huh. who's gay oh, wow. and so she was interviewed and saying hey Angela you, you like you got this award and that award and this award and that award and that award and this award why is she on this team and she goes look mm -hmm. at me look at me and also I'm gay so you tell me now other people go no oh, no it's not because of that because you're too old or whatever mm -hmm. she was destroying yeah. everybody so without her and I'll be honest, I may get in trouble, I don't care. Yeah, there is yeah. no Haley Wickenheiser. Mm -hmm. 
Without her, there is no Cassie Campbell. Without her, there's no Manon Legacy. There is none. Because of her, this beast, a black woman who just whooping everyone's tail in hockey, which is known predominantly as a white person sport, she's coming in and crushing everybody, and she can't get on the Olympic team? Well, my friend, I only got one question left for you, and I promised you that you would be able to, to tuck your little ones in at 7.45. So we're only about a minute. Oh, we're good. It's all good. We're, we're, gonna we're getting we're close. Gonna but I got one last question for you before we wrap up, and then I'm going to say a couple words about next week. But this morning, uh, when my mom and I, we tuned in to uh, St. Thomas, and I, uh, and I, oh, God, do I, did I appreciate your words this morning. But let me ask you, you were, um, you were sitting for the service and i didn't understand and i asked you afterwards if, if you wanted to tell me why you were sitting when we talked a little later because uh you don't do anything by accident so i'm kind of curious so uh this sunday is known as remissiri sunday which is remembering recalling recollection and uh the gospel reading was mark 8 31 to 38 which jesus tells peter get behind me satan you've no idea what's planned for me you're thinking about earthly things. I'm thinking about divine things. And so I purposely sat down to remind myself I'm before God. I must take a humble posture. I wanted to kneel, but may look odd on the camera. But also in regards to that, behind me is a picture of a white Jesus. And so I wanted to speak in regards to that and saying, if you, if you, if you go back into the sermon is recalling, he's not white. No. And also the, in regards to the scripture passages, Peter has a mindset of who God is. He has an expectation of who God is. He has an appearance. Like God is, the Messiah is supposed to look like this. He's supposed to do this. And we're going to be free from the Roman Empire. We're good. I want to be first in line because I want to kill everybody. So the picture is to purposely remind us that God, Jesus, is not white. And to also, we have our expectations for centuries. I'm thinking Jesus is a white man, but is born the first century in Palestine. So it's either your history is wrong or you're blatantly trying to do this. So hence, I purposely put myself down for people to see the picture because I'm trying to be a humble position, but also in the teaching position saying, this is not allowed. You got to stop doing this. I'm not saying you got to paint him black. I'm not saying do that. He's a brown man who's from the first century, but which you now have to be mindful of saying, these images now are hurting people. Because if you're always posturing and presenting Jesus as a blonde man with white skin. And I'm 15 years old. I'm going, I want nothing to do with this Jesus because you guys killed my ancestors, which was then presented to the people coming from the transatlantic slave trade. So I wanted to put it to see, we have to stop doing this yes. in the church, especially because if we want to have more people of BIPOC to therefore to live in the grace and the mercy and the faithfulness of God, don't be doing that crap no, man. because it's not right. It is not right. And it's been also systemic because I remember, go, if I go really quickly here, two years ago, went to my uncle's funeral in Barbados and there's a picture of a white Jesus on the wall. And I literally asked my family, yo, are you serious? This is a black country and you've got a white Jesus? Oh man, that's And they're like, Steve, that's, and they're like, and they're like Steve, shh, shh. Yo, Steve, we're here for your uncle. Can you just sit down and let's come on, man? I'm like, this is unacceptable. Like, I get this if you're in Saskatchewan, but this is unacceptable in a black country. And so, hence, we've, we've presented this and we've postured this, and it's been over, it's been systematized in our brain that he looks like this. You cannot have any graven image of God. That's first and foremost. But to put a white dude on a wall and say, this is what Jesus looks like, a lot of people are going to be freaked out when they meet him. They're going to be freaked out going, what happened? You don't, what the? So hence, that's why I did it. For two reasons. One, it's a, a posturing to be before God, but also it's a learning moment on saying, if we're truly going to recall what God calls us to do, to self-deny, got to change. You got to stop. got to change. Gotta be real. Gotta, we have to change. We have to change. Hence, death and resurrection. There is no resurrection unless you're willing to die. There is no Easter Sunday, praise Jesus, if you're not willing to take your cross and die. Jesus literally says it. You're not willing to do it? You're not willing to sacrifice your mom and your relationship with your dad? You're not willing to, you're not worthy to be with me. That's harsh, but let's be honest, man. Christianity, 
it ain't for the weak. Let's be honest, man. Because you got you got every day you got to give up. Every day you got to say it's about you. And human nature says, screw that. It's about me. And God goes, no, it's about me. And I will work through you. And we we'll, we'll do some beautiful things and dominate the world in God's glory. But it's never about you. So hence Lent, hence the riches of Black History Month, of men and women who have sacrificed all because why? It's not about me. It's about my grandchildren who are coming down the line. I got to pr present this platform that they dominate. But also in regards to Black Lives Matter, not only the history of the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, but today, 2021, I'm saying, I now, Steve Green, must lead and have my children be on a higher platform with my brothers in arms like David Giffen, my brothers like Dev and my sisters and so forth, my wife, Tracy, who is a white woman, we're stepping the game up because they need to have this lead. They need to be raised up and edified and educated. My God friend. is good, son! My friend. <laughs> I could listen to you all night. I could listen to you all night, and oh. uh, it is a it is a privilege, <laughs> a privilege to be called a coach to you. Because I got to tell you, um, it is an edifying experience for me and a deeply spiritual one. So I am so grateful to you. Thank you, Steve. If I can say this to you, man, as I said to you before, if anyone throws any stones at you, man, I got you back. We'll throw stones together. They've been doing it to me for years, man, as a black man. So I'm good. We'll do this together. And whoever ostracized you because we're, we're, because we're partners in crime, we're brothers in arms, man. Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. And the three-strand cord cannot be easily broken. So let's go wreck the world for Jesus, man, straight up. And I don't care who says we can't do it, because God is for us. Who could be against us? Speaking of that, next week, Mark Smith is going to drop in and hang out with me. You know Mark Ooh, Smith. You know Mark Blackify. Smith. Blackify, <laughs> Mark. Blackify. <laughs> I know, I've known Mark Smith for, for almost two decades, and uh, he is one of the most beautiful people I've ever met. Yes. Um, and I, yes. Can't wait to, I can't wait to share Mark, my, my, my friend Mark with a Q. I can't wait to, uh, to share oh, Mark man. with a Q. With the Tell him I say hello. He's, yeah, he's a beautiful man. Awesome musician too, man. Oh, dude, dude. Did you hear him sing Swing Low Sweet Chair? Oh, I did. Rory and I Damn. sat listening the other night. He's unbelievable. Damn! <laughs> That's all I gotta say. Damn! <laughs> hey, I will see you this week, Tuesday. We're back, we're back on for a session, I think. Yes, sir. All right, man. Love to you. Love to your family. Happy gotcha day. Yes, man. Oh, blessed. He's a blessing in our lives. And thank you once again, David, for this opportunity. To everyone, God bless you all and have a very safe night. Love you, brother. Talk soon.